Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the amazing environs of Upper Kaflia Lake in the dedicated wilderness area of the Katmai National Park, just across the Shelikoff Strait from Kodiak Island. The area is a mix of coastal mud flats and steep mountains. The plant life ranges from sedge grass to alders and willow stands. The land is crisscrossed with bear trails, utilized by brown bears over tens of thousands of years to migrate from their winter dens to their feeding grounds along the coast and various bodies of water. Visitors to the area are allowed to acquire visitor camping permits from the park authorities so they can camp and hike in its pristine landscape. Hunting is strictly prohibited, so the wildlife has free reign to live as uninterrupted as possible. It is truly one of the world's most remote and primitive areas that remain untouched by development or disturbance by mankind. The subject of our episode is Timothy Treadwell. He's trekked here for the spring and summer periods of 13 years, and this year has been another remarkable season. Timothy has followed and photographed the area brown bears, many of which he's named, observing their behaviors and temperaments. He pushes the envelope of common sense in many ways, believing that he is so familiar with the bears that they tolerate him and are even friendly to him. He's convinced he's cracked the communication code and can back them down from attacking him by using the intimidating actions and noises they use on each other. He's taking careful notes at some of the bears' favorite fishing holes, noting the various growls they use to communicate their intentions and frustrations. Utilizing similar grunts and gestures, he injects himself into the brown bear community successfully for a long time to study and protect them, according to him. He reported that when he first visited the area, he had sprayed an aggressive brown bear with pepper spray, and the misery of the bear was so severe that he swore off ever using it or even packing it. He didn't believe in using firearms to protect himself either. Treadwell's purpose on traveling to this area is to interfere with potential poachers who, according to him, interlope into the park to harvest bear gallbladders and other parts of bears used in eastern medicine or as keepsakes. He films them and frequently puts himself in the film shot frames to discuss the conditions and circumstances he observes. He takes the photos and film footage back to California where he presents the evidence of his findings to school children to increase awareness of the plight of the bears. He frequently performs this service for free and developed a funding base from his foundation dedicated to preserving brown bear habitat called Grizzly People. This is the organization he founded with long-term romantic interest and friend Jewel Palavac. Jewel acted as the coordinator and public face of the organization while Timothy executed the research. In Treadwell's book, Among Grizzlies, based on his experiences at Upper Kaflia Lake, he indicated that he once encountered a giant boar brown bear on a narrow trail surrounded by a bush too thick to get out of the bear's way. Treadwell collapsed on the trail face up in fear as the bear approached. The bear simply stepped over him. The bear was so fat from eating salmon that its huge gut sagged down and dragged over the prone Treadwell covering his clothes and face with stench and fuzz, but leaving him completely unharmed. The summer of 2003, Treadwell's on-and-off-again girlfriend, Amy Huguenard, would visit him and even go observe the brown bears with him, frequently spending time within just a few yards of the most dangerous predator in North America, if not the world. They slept in a tent and sought campsite positioned just yards from the crossroads of local bear trails so they could keep tabs on the familiar characters they'd grown accustomed to. They stored their food in bear-proof steel drums and dealt with the weather and hardship of the area with aplomb and satisfaction. Treadwell felt as if he was performing his purpose in life and his research fulfilled him. Amy was terrified of the bears, and Treadwell relished the role as her protector, leading her into close proximity of the satiated giants at their fishing holes. She was worried that he had developed a death wish with his obsession and was considering ending their three-year relationship because of it. She only had a few more days, and they would return, and she could cut the relationship off then. Treadwell typically departed the area in mid to late September, just after the last run of salmon flooded the rivers. This year, he packed his bags and flew out to the Anchorage International Airport to return to California on September 29th. His return ticket was more expensive than he thought it should be, and he got into a verbal altercation with the airline attendee. After the argument, Treadwell and Huguenard decided to return to their campsite for two more weeks to wait to see if they could locate a bear he had not seen all summer and wait for ticket prices to decrease. This time frame was pivotal as it put him in the brown bear's environment far later in the season after the bear's main food source would dry up for the winter. 
The weather quickly degrades into extremely windy and rainy fall conditions just before winter sets in, and in Alaska, that transition happens quickly. October 5th was another windy and rainy day, the day before the pair was scheduled to leave again. Treadwell had observed the bears that he was so familiar with had all departed, and a new, more desperate population of interior bears had moved in to try to put on their fat for hibernation. These bears tended to be older or in bad shape compared to the bears who had been feeding on salmon all summer. Treadwell and Huguenard were sheltering in their tent, waiting for the storm to blow over so their puddle jumper flight could bring them back to Anchorage. The rain and wind battered their tent, but above the normal noise of the storm, Treadwell heard a bear. The unmistakable noise of an approaching bear. He peeked his head out of the tent and saw a bear he knew well. This bear was an older bear that had a very hostile attitude. The big boar had not fared well this season and was underweight and looking for food. Typically, in an instance in which he had to confront a bear, Treadwell would stomp his feet and hiss like the bears did to each other. Just before leaving the shelter of the tent, Treadwell reached down to grab his video camera, but the bear was apparently too close to worry about it. In fumbling with the camera, Treadwell apparently turned on the recording function, but didn't successfully remove it. Timothy stepped outside the tent and tried to drive the giant Bruin off with a bluff. The bear was not frightened, though, and immediately knocked Treadwell to the ground. The bear bit and clawed Treadwell while he yelled at Amy to run away, as the bear silently mauled him. Tim's arms and face were bitten, but his main concern was to make sure Amy would get away. Treadwell was being killed by the bear, and his body was being torn apart. He cried out for Huguenard to help him, and she ran over and hit the bear with a pan. The bear was focused on Timothy and paid her no mind at all. The diminutive woman could not impart enough force to distract the bear, let alone injure it. Timothy yelled, He's killing me, over and over, and begged for help. But Amy could do nothing but watch. Treadwell's pleas for help eventually faded as his life was taken during the attack. Upon realizing she could do nothing, Amy panicked and fell into hysterics. She started screaming a shrill scream that could have been easily mistaken as a distressed rabbit. As the bear finished off Treadwell, her screams caught his attention. He approached her, and she was paralyzed with fear, and he killed her as well. The bear would then drag their bodies a short distance from the campsite and cache them to feed off of them as needed. Treadwell's supporter and fellow bear sympathizer, Willie Fulton, was scheduled to fly into Upper Kaflia Lake to pick the pair up. Willie turned the plane into a descending approach and landed the plane on its floats and tied off on the bank. He noticed the absence of the usual wildlife and began yelling for his friends. As he approached the camp through a trail that parted an alder stand, he saw a flash of movement in the bushes. Since he hadn't received any answer, he grew concerned and returned to the shore and the safety of his bush plane. As he walked back, he noticed a very large bear slowly stalking him through the dense vegetation. Willie quickly entered his plane and flew above the area to take a look. As Willie flew over the campsite, he could see one of the lover's rib cages with the bear positioned over it, eating from the remains. Willie attempted to chase the bear off by buzzing it in the plane, but the bear would just eat faster. Willie knew what had happened and departed the area to find assistance from authorities. State authorities returned to the area, flown by helicopter pilot Sam Egley. They hiked the short distance from the lakeshore to the campsite where they ran into the bear who was guarding his cache. The group was armed with various rifles and shotguns of substantial caliber and quickly dispatched the giant man-eater. A necropsy was performed on the 28-year-old bear, and tissues from both Tim and Amy were pulled from its stomach. The recovery party then turned to gathering up the remains of the lovers. Timothy's remains were significantly consumed, and his body was dismembered. His arms were completely separated from his body, and his torso was largely consumed. His spine, hip, and misshapen head were recovered. Amy's body was in similar but better condition. The pair were placed into recovery bags and loaded onto the plane for proper analysis by the coroner. The audio captured during the attack would help the authorities establish the above timeline and would be valuable evidence of the happenings. The recording of the attack was left in the possession of Jewel Palavac, who was advised to destroy it by documentarian Werner Herzog. The later appearance of what was claimed to be the audio tape appeared on the internet, revealing that Palavac had either sold it or it had been stolen from her possession and posted. I will not post a link to this audio file as I cannot verify its authenticity and out of respect for the living family of the deceased. As a former science teacher, I frequently use this incident to pose the question to my students, is this science? Before modern understanding, many naturalists would learn in a manner similar to Treadwell's practices. They would insert themselves into the animal's environment to capture observations and draw conclusions from them. I would like to know if you think Treadwell's practices were scientific or something else. Post it in your comments, please.
Research ecologist Tom Smith was quoted as saying, Treadwell was breaking every park rule that there was in terms of distance to the bears, harassing wildlife, and interfering with natural processes. He also stated that Treadwell had been warned repeatedly and that this tragedy was not unpredictable. For more information, please review the links below the article of this video. Thank you for watching this video, and please leave a like and subscribe to keep up to date on our latest videos in our series. Be careful, especially in bear country.